Welcome into the Living Room Disciple podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Sarah L. Sanderson, the author of The Place We Make. Sarah describes herself as a writer, speaker, and teacher who believes in the life-giving freedom found in radical honesty. We all want that freedom. We all we all say we value honesty, but oftentimes our honesty only goes until it meets up with our shame. In other words, if there's something that I'm ashamed of and you bring it up, I'm probably not going to dive into radical honesty or vulnerability. I'm probably going to deflect or push it away or make a joke out of it because I'm uncomfortable holding things that I'm ashamed of. I'm uncomfortable with vulnerability. This doesn't just stop with individuals or families. Shame affects institutions, communities, even nations. And there is a skeleton in our nation's closet that today we're going to talk about with Sarah. And if you're tempted to, when you start to hear this conversation, if you're tempted to turn it off or to deflect or to run away, know that that is because you are uncomfortable holding shame. And that is a feeling that we all feel. So today with Sarah, we are talking about the skeleton in in America's closet, the skeleton of racial injustice. And I know some of you will balk at that. Some of you will say things like, I I think we've moved past this. I don't know why we still have to talk about this. Haven't we already reckoned with the way that racial injustice has faced our country? And I would just say to you, let's dive into holding on to shame today. Let's not run away. Let's not deflect from shame, but let's dive into the shame, hoping that we can find freedom and healing on the other side. The truth will set us free. So let's dive into this conversation with a generous and charitable posture, the posture of Jesus who says that the truth will set you free, as we talk about a difficult topic with Sarah on this episode of the Living Room Disciple Podcast, where discipleship finds a home. I am here with Sarah L. Sanderson, the author of The Place We Make. Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so excited to have this conversation. I'm not kidding that The Place We Make was probably a top three book for me in 2023. Um, Really just powerful, gripping every... I I couldn't stop. I listened to the audiobook, so I told you a minute ago I'm familiar with your voice already. Um, But just I, I couldn't stop listening. Every chapter that ended, I, I wanted to keep going regardless of what I was doing. So thank you for, I'm sure it took years of study and research to, to tell the complete story <laughs> and not to mention the just the emotional hurdles that you probably had to jump through in order to, to reach the level of honesty and vulnerability that, that you shared on the page. So thank you so much for the place we make. Um, and in case it's not clear to our listeners already, everybody, please go by and, and listen to or read this book. It is fantastic. And you're going to hear more about why. Um, so Sarah, tell us a little bit about the book. And I would love to hear a little bit about why you felt compelled to tell the story of Jacob Vanderpool. Why does his story matter to us? Yeah. So the book is, um, you mentioned that name, Jacob Vanderpool. The book kind of does two things. It tells the story of Jacob Vanderpool, who was... Um, a boarding house operator in Oregon City in 1851. And he became the only person exiled from the state or at the time territory of Oregon because of his racial heritage, because he was black. Uh, So Oregon was the only state to join the union with an anti-black exclusion clause, exclusion law on the books. And Jacob Vanderpool was the only person to be exiled from Oregon because of that law. So the book, I said it does two things. It tells that story, but then it also tells my story of growing up white in Oregon and coming to know more about Jacob Vanderpool and how that story kind of turned my life upside down. Um, And I'd say that the the reason Jacob Vanderpool's story matters to me, um, for one thing, I discovered it's it's actually my family's story. Some of my ancestors were involved in expelling him from Oregon. And then it also just illuminated for me so much about uh, the history of racial injustice in this country that I didn't know before. Yeah, absolutely. 
And so speaking of that, is would you say that as a Christian, would you say that we have a responsibility to look into these things, to be aware of these things, to know, um, not saying that we all need to do research projects and write books about individual <laughs> individuals that have had terrible things happen to them, but um, do you think we have a, a responsibility as Christians to be aware of these things from our past? I do. And I would go farther than that. I would say that I believe that Christians have the capability to be on the forefront of these conversations because as Christians, we know what to do with shame. And Mm. I think that it's shame that prevents so many of us white people from wanting to look, you know, whether we feel shame or it's just something in the background that feels like, Oh, I I don't think I want to go there. Um, There's a lot of shame, I think, because there's so much history in our country that we don't really know what to do with. But as Christians, we know that we've been loved and forgiven by Jesus. Mm. So we should be free to go in and, you know, I mean, I I put a smile on my face as if it's joyful. It's not joyful. Like it's still, there's a lot of lament and grief. Um, But the knowledge that we've been forgiven should allow us to to be willing and and able to step into this conversation yeah and so other than reading your book what are some steps that you should say we can take what are some ways that our education can improve around these these topics of race yeah i think that um i mean i i think especially for white people it's it's hard to know how to locate ourselves in these stories um Hmm. You know, it's Black History Month. Like, I hope people are going out and learning some stories about, you know, wonderful African-Americans who've done amazing things. And that's great. And we should do that. But it's really hard for us, I think, to look at, okay, why did Black people have to struggle so much? Well, it was because white people (laughs) were oppressing them. And so for white people, it can be really difficult to know how to, how to think about that, you know, especially if it's our ancestors, our family members, our community members, our people. Um, and so, so what do we do with that when it's, we're talking about the sins of our own ancestors? Um, so my, my hope is that people, yeah, will read the book. Um, and then I, I, like I said, I hope that Christians will feel emboldened by the love and grace and forgiveness available to us through the Holy Spirit to say, okay, we don't have to be afraid. Let's find out. Right. Exactly. I've been thinking a lot about the idea of self-justification, um, mm. specifically when Jesus is having the conversation with the lawyer who who goes over the the most important commands to love God Mm -hmm. and love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And then it says, Mm -hmm. seeking to justify himself. He asked him, who Mm -hmm. is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. And I think we can often fall into the same, the same pit, seeking to justify ourselves. We say, well, Mm -hmm. I didn't do that. Or that, that was a long time ago. Or even if it was my ancestor, it wasn't me. Um, And you had a, a gripping section in your book about generational sin and the way the Bible actually talks about how even if even if I'm not responsible for something my great great grandfather did, how there is a sense of of generational sin that that passes on, and in some way I have to grapple with, and I have to be honest about and vulnerable with. Um, so, can you speak to that a little bit? Why would that be yeah. the case? Yeah, I think that so often, you know, we we focus on honor your father and mother, and we think, okay, honoring someone means you can't ever say anything bad about them. Hmm. But when you look at the Bible itself the Bible tells the honest truths about, you know, yes. the, the actual fathers and mothers of the people in the Bible. Um, and so it can't possibly mean that to honor your father and mother and previous generations, that you can never say the truth about what they did. Um, and yeah. maybe there's a way even that, that honoring someone means being honest about them, because if we're not willing to say the things that, we're wrong, then how can we ever trust the things that we want to say that, that we're good or that we're right. 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 So, and we're really honoring we're, a shadow of them, not really them. If we're not willing right. to tell the whole truth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, I, oh, I, um, I think that as Christians, our call, as we see, you know, there, there are people 
particularly in the Old Testament. And sometimes people will say, well, that's an Old Testament thing. That's not what Jesus wants us to do. But man, I love the Old Testament. (laughs) I just think (laughs) that the story of the people of God doesn't all get thrown out the window when Jesus comes along. Um, And so when we see in the Old Testament people who step up and say, I'm going to repent of not just my own, but also my ancestors' sins, I think that that's a pattern that can be carried forward even into, you know, what we know of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. And so stepping even a step beyond that, you were very honest in your book about some prejudices that you've had in your own life, some things that you discovered in your own heart as you looked into your family and your community's history, you started to realize actually that didn't stop with them, that it passed down to me in certain ways. And this this podcast is actually our, our general kind of motivating question is how is blank forming us? And so we'll have a, a conversation about whatever the topic is. And we're asking, how is that forming us to either look more like Christ or less like Christ? And I think one of the things we often don't pay attention to is history. Our mm-hmm. histories form us. Um, we come from somewhere. What What is at the source of the river is trickling down to the, the end of the river, right? Yes. And so yeah. um, whether we are willing to face it or not, whether we're willing to hold the shame and get uncomfortable or not, there are ways as white people that we all have some internalized um, prejudice and even racism that we need mm-hmm. to confront and be honest mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So can you share a little bit about your story with that and and what that has meant to you? Yeah. Yeah. So my first kind of awareness that, that, that racism lived in me uh, was when I was 20 years old. And I tell this story in the book, I, I went to Africa on kind of a, it was like a, I don't know if I would call it a mission trip, but it was like a mission adjacent trip. (laughs) Uh, I was definitely there to learn and to serve, um, sent by my Christian college. And um, so I I thought of myself as, you know, the the right kind of white person, like the person who wants to go and show up and help people. And, And the first morning that I was there, I looked out the window and I just was hit with this thought it was like before i could even think mm. i realized that i had a thought that was racist and i had never i had to go out of my comfort zone out of my you know normal patterns and places where i was normally kind of going in my daily life to the other side of the world to suddenly realize that and then I you know I was 20 and I held on to that for a long time and it was like I don't know what to do with this um and then it was when I started investigating Jacob Vanderpool's story and finding out about the ways that my own family had been involved in expelling him from Oregon that was when I started to connect the dots like oh those things that I am aware of that live in me, those prejudiced thoughts or feelings or whatever it is that, you know, just flicker up every once in a while. It's not like I'm going around like steeping myself in these thoughts, but every once in a while one pops up and I realize, oh, that's there. And what I realized when I started thinking about this is it it makes sense because who we are as a society is all built on the past, right? I mean, when I look at my kids, my kids are teenagers now, and there was a time when they were babies, and now they're teenagers. And there's definitely a difference between a baby and a teenager, but there's never been a moment when they turned from a baby to a teenager, right? It's just been this gradual, like, oh, there's something different now. And I've realized that that's the way history is too, you know, we're, we're a different country now in 2024 than we were in 1619 or 1776 or 1851, but there's never been a dividing line where we turned from one thing into something else. We've been growing as a society all along. And so to look at the history helped me to make sense of what I was finding in myself. Um, and then it, it helped me to mark, okay, for myself personally, 
maybe here's the line where I can begin to say, no, I do want to be someone different. And how do I, how do I make that happen? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really helpful framework for looking at some of the complicated Old Testament texts that that talk about generational mm-hmm. sin. And in our very individualistic culture, we'll, we look at those and go, well, how can I be held accountable for something that, that I had nothing to do with? And it was decades or generations before I was born. But really, the way you describe history playing into our own lives and forming and shaping us, that's exactly right. Like, it's not simply that we are accountable for something somebody else did. It's that because they did that, it trickled down to the next generation. And then the aftershock of that trickled to the next generation. And then ultimately ends up even just a a little bit of it in my heart. Um, And so we have to continually be working out the, the injustices that happened in the past so that we don't repeat them in the future. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's so, so helpful as we approach those, those Old Testament texts and as we deal with the difficulties of, of our own history and our own past. Um, and so specifically your book, I've, I've read several books on this subject, but, but they, they're usually kind of more big umbrella books that are kind of looking at, um, the whole history across, across the nation and the way that you dove into, no, I actually want to know how it impacted literally the town that I live in. Um, was was really fascinating to me and was something, even as I host this podcast where we ask, how are things forming us? I never thought, how is the town that I live in forming me um, as opposed mm-hmm. to if I lived somewhere else? Um, and so what was that like for you to, to go on such a localized journey as opposed to just writing a book about the history of race in, in the whole country? Yeah, well, it, it was a fascinating journey. And I think that what made me brave enough to do it at all because I had a lot of fear about telling the story but what made me brave enough to do it at all was that it was small and local you know I knew that I was not qualified to talk about the whole history of racism Mm. forever everywhere um and and that felt so overwhelming you know it feels so overwhelming even to think about but um just I, I felt like if I could just get my hands around this one story, you know, of this one man in this one place and time. Um, and then it, it became such a fascinating journey because it, it really did feel like the Holy spirit was kind of feeding me my next line, you know, in a sense, it was like, mm. when I began working on this, I had no idea. I had no idea that I was writing a book. I had no idea what I was going to find. You know, I often, when I'm reading a book, y- you often sometimes feel like, oh, the the author just sat down and like started writing and then got to the end and was done. And that is not how it was at all. It was like, I, I got curious and I researched something and then that led to something else and then that led to something else and then so the whole thing kind of just unspooled um and i mean even like the things that happen at the end of the book didn't happen until i had written two-thirds of the book so i was like writing the book and wondering how am i going to end this and then you know this sort of ending falls out of the sky and it's like, (laughs) Oh, that's how I'm going to end it. So it's been a fascinating journey. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a lot of introspection there and a lot of kind of viewing your community through a new lens and being able to share with people who share that community with you and, and all the the ramifications of that are are beautiful. And I think so, so incredibly helpful Um, and an encouragement to me to think more deeply. I remember I was listening to you had a chapter about how you would take your children down to to play in a river or a lake or something near your home. Um, and describing how at one point there were native Americans who lived on that land. Um, and I was mowing my grass with my son and just stopped and thought like at one point, I don't know if there was grass here, what was, what was here. Um, but at some point, something, something, somebody else lived here. This was somebody else's home. Um, and to to really grapple with that really really was a kind of out of body experience mm. to to start to think through that lens mm. and think about my community in a little bit of a new way. Um, yeah. So thank you yeah. for that. Um, and I think a lot of times when we start to peel back those layers in in chapter two of your book, you had this description of the temptation when we hear about something like in 2020, we had the stories of 
Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And when we hear stories like that, a lot of times our immediate instinct is to go like, oh, I didn't know about that or, or to distance, mm. distance ourselves to go. That is so shocking rather than going, yeah, that kind of makes sense how that could, ha- could happen because of the history that we have <laughs> in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. where do you think that impulse comes from? Why do we want to immediately distance ourselves and pretend that we couldn't have even been aware that something like that was possible? Well, I think it's a defense mechanism. I think that, um, you know, when, when we're shocked and horrified by something terrible that happens, um, if we can say, oh, I had no idea, then Mm. that sort of absolves us of maybe being part of the story, part of the community that would allow something like that to happen. Um, and so, yeah, when those things happen and they keep happening, <laughs> hmm. um, like, yes, they're shocking and they're horrible, but we shouldn't be surprised because of the history. And I, coming into this, you know, part of the reason I, I wanted to write this book was because I wanted to write a book written from the perspective of a white person who's just starting to figure these things out. Right. I didn't want to write 20 years from now, you know, if I, I don't know what I'm going to do in the next 20 years, but (laughs) if I ever get to a place where I feel like, Oh, I'm an expert on this. You know, I didn't want to write that book. I wanted to write a book from the place of, I'm just starting to figure this out. I'm just beginning to go on this journey. Would you like to come with me? Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I've just, you know, as I've started working on this, I've started to begun, begin to realize that shift from I'm so shocked mm. to I, I, I can't be surprised about this. I need to educate myself to know where this comes from, to know why this is a recurrent problem, and then maybe figure out where to go from here. Yeah. And what my role is in it. So I think, I think the place we make could have been a book where you simply told a story as if like, I moved to this town, and then I discovered this, these things about it. Um, But I don't, you didn't allow it to stop there. You, you went, well, actually, this, this plays into my story. And I realized that now that I have family members that were involved, and how did that affect me and my upbringing? And, um, And I think if we just stop with and and I think this can be a temptation on on the left and with progressive Christians is we can stop with, yeah, of course that happened because we have such broken institutions and whatever. And we never stop mm-hmm. and go, well, wait a minute, actually, I've been impacted by that too. And how could I perpetuate that whether I know it or not? Um, so I think that honesty and vulnerability, being able to to grapple with our, our sense of shame, things we don't want to talk about or think about is so important yeah. um, because this is not an issue that is only dealt with by the right or only dealt with by the left. This is something that we've dealt with for hundreds of years and we're never going to figure it out if we sweep it under the rug and pretend that, that it's not true or didn't happen. Um, we need to be honest Absolutely. about it. And so I, I appreciated yeah. you you describe it as a journey for you. And, and it did come across that way that, that we were on this journey with you. And um, so I think that allowed you to kind of model for us. Um, and I know you wouldn't say that you're a perfect model of how to do it or anything like that, but it allowed it allowed me to think like if she could take these steps, then so can I. And and so thank you for that. Um, I think of the apostle Paul writing, follow me as I follow Christ. And I think that was a a wonderful example of that. Um, And so when we start to grapple with these things that are in our hearts, um, it's time to do something with it. If we just leave it there, leave it in the dark, but we're like, well, I think about it and I'm honest with it in my head. Like that doesn't actually accomplish anything. We need to bring it out into the light. Um, so when it comes to these difficult subjects, what is the role of confession in your eyes? Yeah, I mean, you know, what is that? I should find out who said this, but didn't somebody say something about confession is the spark that leads to revival or something like that? Um, it sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, I I think that any kind of movement of the spirit has to begin with we've got to get honest about our own hearts yeah right because it's really easy to 
listen to a sermon and go, you know, oh man, I wish so-and-so was listening to this right now. Or, you know, or I, I, I hope my husband's paying attention or, you know, somebody, somebody else needs to hear that. But yeah, right. when we can get honest about ourselves, <laughs> that's when God has something to work with in us because we're recognizing and allowing God to come in and, and work. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, confession. And I don't know what this should look like, but my sense is that white people are hungry for places and spaces to talk about this stuff. Hmm. Um, as I've been going around, you know, I've been invited to, different places to talk about this book in the last six months. Um, And my sense is that the white people in the audience want to talk about it. Mm. We just don't always know how, and we're a little bit afraid of looking like, you know, saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Um, And And so, you know, I don't know exactly what it should look like. Um, I tell a story in, uh, in the book about in Austin Channing Brown's book, I'm still here. She describes that after she'll go to a speaking event, dozens or hundreds or however many white people will line up wanting to talk to her and wanting to confess some little racialized Mm -hmm. sin to her. And she is like, I, this is not my job. I cannot absolve you, right? Like, it, it, it can't just be that we go find a person of color and say, like, this is the thing that I'm aware of. Like, let me tell you and you can forgive me. Like, we can't receive, it's, it's not the job of people of color to forgive us. Um, but when we confess to God and receive God's forgiveness, then there's... I think it makes room in our hearts for God to get us ready. Um, So my kind of big vision, what I would love to see, (laughs) you know, the Holy Spirit do, um, whether it's through this book or what I have to say, or, you know, use, use anything like go God go. But um, (laughs) I would love to see white American Christians just getting more comfortable looking at our history, looking at our own hearts, being willing to admit that, yeah, we've got some stuff in there that we don't know what to do with. And actually we do need God to help us in this particular way. And what was it, what will it look like for us not just to confess or to repent, but to, to use that movement as a step towards asking the question of, okay, what comes next? Right. Yeah. I think you mentioned in the book that your husband is a pastor and you had a, a chance to speak on racism at some point at your church. And that led to several conversations with, with people in your church who wanted to talk with you about it and often to push back and just to say things like, well, I don't think we need to talk about this. We, we should leave this in the past or I didn't do that. Those kind of things. Um, you said that at that time you would try to come up with the right stats to share with them or have the right anecdotes, um, thinking, well, surely if I have the right stats that say this is an, an issue across mm-hmm. our, our whole society, then they'll believe me. And then that didn't work. And you went, well, maybe if I had a small anecdote where they can hear a story, well, that didn't work either. So, so what, where was the glimmer of hope that you finally realized actually this, this is a slight bridge that, that allows me to have these conversations. So it it was in self-disclosure. It was in, yeah, I had a number of conversations with people like racism isn't a problem anymore. It's not real anymore. We don't have to do like, we've dealt with that. We've done like, there's no laws on the books anymore that say, you know, black people can't live in Oregon. Like this is in the past. And, but when I would say, I know racism is real because it's still in me. That was when they would kind of go like, Oh, wow, we're going to go there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that 
for us to talk about this subject at all as white people, we have to be able to go there Mm -hmm. because it's too easy to get on a high horse and say, you know, those people who vote the wrong way or who have the wrong, you know, things in their homes or watch the wrong channel or whatever it is. But if it's in here, then that's where we need to start. Yeah. So if the proof that racism exists and even existed is that it still exists in some way in me, this goes back to what we've been talking about throughout this conversation, that that history has a way of forming us. And so we can actually see the ramifications of history for, for good or for evil in our own hearts. And that's true going all the way back to the cross and resurrection, we see the ramifications of the cross and resurrection in our hearts as the Holy Spirit molds us into the image of Christ. Um, But we can also see the ways that we have been malformed by things in our past that maybe we are not accountable for, maybe things that we didn't do, but they have shaped us and formed us in some way. And so we need to be aware of them. And so to say well, racism isn't an issue anymore while pretending that I've never had a prejudiced thought before in my life, which is not true for any of us. Um, Clearly, there is a history of racism that continues to affect us if we still are capable of having prejudiced thoughts, words, actions, jokes, um, things things that come out in the open and show you've actually been formed by the way things were in the 60s and in the 1850s and in the 1760s and on and on and on. Um, so it's it's one thing to just talk about, let's be honest, let's heal ourselves. And it can come across as kind of a kumbaya, the white people are going to be at peace again <laughs> kind of kind of deal. But um, you you throughout the book have, have this image of shalom that we're actually working towards. And I would love to just finish up our conversation by talking about shalom. What and and this is this is a conversation that's bigger than than racial injustice. This is a conversation of the eschatolo- eschatology of of scripture, where where everything's moving, why Christ came, what we're moving towards. Um, and so what is the Shalom, specifically when it comes to this topic of of racial justice, but but also shalom um, in ourselves, in our societies, and and worldwide. Honestly, can you just describe shalom and paint a picture of where is this all aiming? Yeah. So, you know, I was thinking about through the book. I talk about various kind of ways that, as I like your word, malformed, like ways that history has malformed me into different specific sins and kind of imagining how I might overturn that legacy and sort of what's the opposite of that. So when I was thinking about white supremacy, this idea that white people are just better than everybody else, um, the opposite isn't white inferiority, right? Like we're not... Mm. The goal isn't that all the white people are now oppressed and the people of color are all are on top, right? The goal is that everybody's in the place where they're supposed to be. So that's kind of how I got to Shalom is just thinking about this idea of everything in its place. And we see this Mm. in scripture, you know, let the, um, the the hills be made low and the valleys be raised up. You know, this idea of like things that are too high need to be brought low and things that are too low need to be brought high so that everything is kind of on the metaphorical same level playing field. Um, and so I, I think this will have to be worked out in some very specific, tangible ways. One way that is, you know, we could have a whole nother hour conversation about money and wealth and how, Mm. how have specific racist practices in our country's history led to this enormous wealth gap between the average white household and the average black household. Mm. And so it's one thing to say like, Oh, we want Shalom. There's going to have to be some kind of narrowing of that wealth gap. And so Mm. what will that look like? How will we get there? Um, And that is, 
you know, I am not an economic policy expert, <laughs> but my prayer is that as a society, we will get to the place where we realize, yes, something was stolen from people who were enslaved. And we can't move forward together as a society until what was stolen is paid back. Yeah. And that's going to involve money. <laughs> so that's right. one way. Um, reparations and what that looks like as a society, what that looks like on an individual level. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can work that out together and as individuals. Um what does it look like for us if we are from a, a people, a, a family, a culture who has thought of ourselves as the ones on top? What would it look like for us to start serving others? Um, yeah. And what I love about God <laughs> I love a lot of things about God, but one thing I just, I love the fact that the Holy spirit is so creative. Mm. I mean, there are going to be a million different ways that this will look. Um, and the way that it's going to look for me tomorrow is different than the way it's going to look for me next month or next year. And it's different than the way it's going to look for you or for somebody listening to this. But I think maybe one way to begin is simply to ask God, um, what would it look like for me yeah. to um, take steps towards Shalom in my town, in my community, in my life, um, and see what, see what happens. I love that. And I'm so glad that you brought, brought that up as well, because I mean, we, I, I almost feel a little guilty having this whole conversation. We've been talking about the the way that the history of racism is impacting my heart. And I didn't even take a step to, to think, well, actually the history of racism is actually having tangible effect, effects on black mm. people who are still affected by it. And the evidence for them isn't just a heart posture. The evidence for them is I still have to grapple with poverty or, or be forced to live in this neighborhood and I'm unable to purchase a home or whatever mm. it is because of the laws that were on the books just 50 years ago or, or even yeah. more recently. Um, yeah. And so just as there's evidence of past racism in my heart, there's evidence of past racism in real living, working, social conditions of real people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, just thank you for opening <laughs> opening my eyes once yeah. again. Um, yeah. And to, to look and, and I think part of what the Holy Spirit does in allowing us to have our imaginations colored to see Shalom mm -hmm. is allowing us to look through the eyes of another person Mm -hmm. um, to walk in somebody else's shoes, um, to mm -hmm. see from another perspective, from another life story. Mm -hmm. um, and so as I read your book, or as I read Austin Channing Brown, Brown's book, um, I can literally see the world, in a sense, through your perspective for just a minute, because the Holy Spirit allow allowed this to, to come together. Um, and so I would just encourage people to definitely pick up your book, but also find ways to look at the world through the eyes of our black brothers and sisters who face struggles that we don't have to face simply because of the color of our skin. Um, and, and those are still very real because of the ramifications of, of past injustices, but because of present injustices as well. Um, and so as we wrap up, and I hope that listeners are feeling encouraged to pursue Shalom, um, even though it often goes through the, the path of shame, the valley of the shadow of death. death. Mm -hmm. um, I hope we can leave on a note that, that pushes people towards that shalom. Um, but, but as we wrap up this conversation, um, I hope our listeners will, will want to stay in touch with you and, and pick up your book. But, but where can we stay in touch with you and follow what you're doing online? So I do have a website. It's www.sarahlsanderson.com. Um, and on the website, you can sign up for my email newsletter, which is very occasional. Do not fear that I will overrun your <laughs> inbox. Um, I'm also, I'm, I still have a Twitter profile, but it seems like there's kind of been a mass exodus from Twitter lately. Um, I'm spending more time on threads these days, which is where I met you. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Instagram, Facebook. Uh, that's about it. Yeah, one of those ways. And off the top of your head, do you know your handle on any of those platforms? Uh, so I think on Threads, it's Sarah L. Sanderson Writer. Perfect. Um, I think that's the same on Instagram and Facebook, and it's different on Twitter, but um, yeah, Sarah L. Sanderson Writer. And we'll get that in the show notes, whether it's right or not. Sweet. <laughs> we'll we'll get the right version me. in the show notes. <laughs> yes, Sounds exactly. Good. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. It was a, a blessing to talk with you. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of the Living Room Disciple podcast. Make sure to check out Sarah's book, The Place We Make, and to support her work online. You can also support our work around here by heading to livingroomdisciple.com and becoming a Patreon supporter. Or if you got something from this episode, share it with a friend. Thank you to Anissa Leib for producing the episode, Eric Church for getting it out to you, and Daniel Ramirez for the music. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Living Room Disciple Podcast, where discipleship finds a home.